Joining us now by phone is Michael Cohen. How you doing? I'm doing well. Only you, Nicole Wallace. Only you can get me on the phone when I just <laughs> arrived home from a grand jury, two days of grand jury testimony. Tell me what you can about the level of engagement from the grand I heard you answer a question as you were walking away that each of the grand jurors asked you questions. Did we hear that right? Yeah, almost each of the grand jurors. They were very involved. Uh, they were mesmerized by the prosecutor. It was, it, it was an easy experience. Let me just say that. And I know you're going to be protective of Alvin Bragg's office, and you will not want to betray any of the substance. So, so let me see if I can come at it this way. Um, do you believe you were the last witness they heard from? You know, I don't know the answer. Again, I'm not involved in the inner discussions regarding the completion of this case or the length of time it will take before which Alvin Bragg's office makes its ultimate determination. But I would suspect that I am certainly close to the end of the testimony that is necessary. Did the questioning seem informed by previous appearances from uh, Hope Hicks or Kellyanne Conway in terms you know, of what? You know, again, N Nicole, you're the greatest. <laughs> Love coming on the show, and I plan on coming uh, on the show very, very soon. I really don't want to get into any of the sum and substance of what we discussed and how they based their questions or predicated their questions upon. It would just be unfair to do. Let me ask you if you share Andrew Weissman's legal analysis then that start the, the reemergence of Stormy Daniels today as someone that the DA's office talked to today, I think, and is willing to come in and talk again, um, if that signals that an indictment is inevitable. Do you share Andrew Weissman's assessment? Well, I think many people made that assessment and many people made the assessment prior to the reemergence of Stormy, um, that it was happening anyway. So there's a lot of opinions that are out there. Um, if, in fact, that Stormy is someone that they are going to look at uh, as a substantial witness for this case, I am certain that she will do a fantastic job. She's <laughs> very quick on her feet. And, again, the most important thing that needs to be remembered here is that the truth is what will prevail. Not facts, not fiction, not, not fiction, but merely the facts. And the facts do not benefit the former president. Do you, I don't know if you saw, my, my colleague Ari Melber did a masterful interview with one of Trump's attorneys. And I, I have a hard time boiling down what, what, what Trump's current position is. It, it, it's so Trumpian. It, it, it's not even a, I guess he denies the relations with Stormy Daniels, but he seems to be arguing at the same time that the hush money would have been paid whether or not he was running for office to protect him from Melania. Is that your understanding of Trump's current defense? So look, again, it starts going into the sum and substance of issues that could be related to this case. I'm trying to be extremely respectful to the DA. What I will say to you is I did see Ari Melber's handling of Joe Tacopina. And to be honest, I was embarrassed for him. I was actually embarrassed for our profession. He looked completely unhinged. There's something definitely wrong there. But the worst thing is he's following in Rudy Kaludi's steps. When you go out and you make yourself the center of attention, at least know the facts. It's one thing when you're talking to some of these other stations where facts don't matter, it's merely playing to a party of one. You're not playing to a party of one when you're sitting across the desk from Ari Melber. And he wasn't going to just accept whatever answer that Joe Tacopina decided to put out there. He was going to challenge him. And sadly, right, it's not the first time. George Stephanopoulos did the exact same thing and schooled him. He's making Trump look even worse, if that's possible. 
if that's possible. We went back and looked at what, because Stormy Daniels is back in the news late today, um, we went back and looked at what she wrote in her book. It's called Full Disclosure. It came out in 2018. I understood it from, from sources pretty close to Donald Trump to have been a pretty big event for the White House when it came out. She writes this about Trump, quote, he showed me a photo of Melania holding little Baron, who was only four months old. It was adorable, and I could tell it made him genuinely proud. He asked me about my family, and I gave him the briefest of bios, but I was impressed that he was at least showing some give and take in conversation. Quote, I have to ask you a question, he said. It's kind of offensive, so I apologize in advance if you're offended. Go ahead, I said. What's the situation on royalties in the adult business? Does that anecdote ring true to you, Michael? <laughs> so I read the book while I was in Otisville, mm -hmm. and I've actually discussed it with Stormy. I know, uh, on, on your on podcast. podcast, yeah. Yes, but I also read the book while I was in Otisville. Um, does it ring true? Listen, the man has no cooth. He has, you know, he has the ability to believe that he can do or say anything that he wants and the terrible comments that he keeps making about her uh, in terms of appearance, it, again, it just detracts from him, uh, makes him look, again, even worse than he actually looks, which is hard to believe. So I apologize in advance if this butts up against your lines, but I do want to ask you, because um, I think it's, it's something that our, our viewers um, will want to know, if not today, then eventually. Do, you don't have any um, doubt in your mind that Donald Trump had uh, relations with Stormy Daniels and paid to keep them secret ahead of the campaign? Well, let me just say, you're right. I can't actually discuss, uh, you know, uh, to answer those questions at this present moment. Um, soon, but just not right now. Again, I just left the grand jury. Um, it would be improper for me to discuss anything that could be related to this investigation. Okay, Michael, so we'll let SDNY do the talking. Let me read from your sentencing memo. Quote, this is from prosecutors and investigators associated with the Southern District of New York. I know not held too high in your esteem, but the world over thinks a lot of um, them. Quote, well, they certainly think a lot of themselves as well. Fair. Quote, during the campaign, Michael Cohen played a central role in two similar schemes to purchase the rights to stories, each from women who claimed to have had an affair with individual one. That was SDMY's word, DOJ's word for Donald J. Trump. So as to suppress the stories and thereby prevent them from influencing the presidential election. With respect to both payments, Michael Cohen acted with the intent to influence the 2016 presidential election. Michael Cohen coordinated his actions with one or more members of the campaign, including through meetings and phone calls about the fact, nature, and timing of the payments. In particular, and as Cohen himself has now admitted, with respect to both payments, he acted in coordination with and at the direction of individual one. Do you think that Alvin Bragg's office sees individual one the same way SDNY put in writing they saw individual one? You know, I never like to put myself into the position of what somebody else thinks. What I will say to you is that um, I have no reason to disqualify any of the comments or the readings that you just took from the document that was a charging document against me. Michael, have you heard from anyone at SDNY? Yeah, again, I don't want to talk about anything that involves this investigation. There are several investigations that are going on right now, not just here at the district attorney's office, but as you're well aware, with the New York attorney general, with our unsinkable attorney general, Tish James. So my, my goal, which I had said even at the time of my sentencing, is that I will cooperate. I will provide information which is truthful to the extent that I am wanted or needed. I, I want to ask you about attacks that I know really bother you um, uh, of your credibility. Um, Mark Pomerantz, I think, wrote about how 
important corroboration was, and he was able to achieve that pretty easily with his multiple meetings with you. Alvin Bragg clearly, um, whether it was a perception that predated his active phase of this investigation or something he encountered, I, I don't know, and, and you're welcome to illuminate me, but clearly your testimony was deemed credible by Mark Pomerantz, who led the investigation into these matters under Cy Vance and by Alvin Bragg, if you are, as everyone speculates, either the final witness or one of the final witnesses in front of his grand jury. I, I, so again, with, with, with Mark Pomerantz and Alvin Bragg as being able to attest to your credibility, I want to give you a chance to um, respond to anyone who questions it. I don't really particularly care about those who want to question my credibility. It wasn't just Alvin Bragg's office that acknowledges the accuracy and the truthfulness of the statements that I provided. Uh, it's not just the attorney general who did that. It's not just members of Congress who I testified. I testified uh, six or seven times before Congress. Uh, it's also the Mueller team. So anybody that wants to attack my credibility, we understand why you're doing it. It's like what I had said to Jim Jordan uh, during that oversight testimony. I know what you're doing. I know the playbook because I helped to write it for Donald, and it's not going to work for you. Truth is the truth, and as Buddha said, truth will always rise. Um, I don't know that we can top a, a quote like that, but I, I want to I um, see if, if, if I can ask you one, one final question here. Um, do you believe that there is one set of rules for Donald Trump and another for you? Or do you believe everyone will be held under the same standard based on the rule of law, the federal and state level? Well, unfortunately, we haven't seen Donald Trump held accountable for any of his dirty deeds. In fact, as I have stated so many times on your program and others, I'm the only one who was held accountable for somebody else's dirty deeds. Now, I acknowledge what I had done, which is wrong. Of course, I've also stated on your show that there are many things that I pled guilty to that were not legitimate. But putting all that aside, I acknowledge what I did wrong. This is not a man who takes responsibility for any of his actions. And I do believe that there will be accountability. And I think it's extremely important that everyone be considered equal under the eyes of the law. And that as the as we Democrats like to continuously say, the adage, no, no one is above the law.